And then you suddenly realize that the sisters in the choir are looking so beautiful. God says there is no escape route. Because in the eyes of God, marriage is not just about sex. Marriage is about destiny. In the sight of God. And somebody is saying, you, you people come up with all these phrases. Can you show us in the Bible? Oga, oh it is there in black and white. The Bible says that God saw that man, it was not good for him to be what? Alone. Listen. Now, if I look at my brother and I say, it's not good for him to be alone. What should be the answer to solving aloneness? What is the answer? Companionship. But what does God say? It's not good for man to be alone. I will make him a companion. No, I will make him a helpmeet. So in the eyes of God, you are alone when you can't fulfill destiny. You can't fulfill destiny. Man was alone, so the, the thing that God wanted to achieve, the, in the mind of God, what he wanted to achieve was to, like my brother was saying, multiply himself on the face of the earth. Oh, you are not with me. Sure, you know that the reason God created man is not because God was lacking something. You know there are preachers in the poopy telling you that you complete God. You don't complete God, though. You, 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 they, 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 they prop you up and build you in the spirit and tell you that God was missing something. So he created man so that man could come and feel a hole in his heart. God is perfect. There is no need in God. If God were to ever lack anything, then that entity is no longer God. Your worship is not doing God a favor. Your praise is not something you are doing for God that God cannot do for himself. Oh my God. I know you don't, you don't, you don't like me to say these kind of things, but read your Bible. God himself will come and tell you, he will say, I am a righteous God. There is none like me upon the face of the earth. God knows his what. He doesn't need you to tell him. God knows who he is. God knows his powers. And before man was created, worship existed in heaven. You are not doing something special in the earth. And this is why I teach my people, worship is a privilege. That you can come into his presence. Like our sister was leading us to chat. That song, I must learn it before I leave Canon. What? He said, my eyes have seen the king of Zion. What, what are the words of that song? My eyes have seen Zion's king in his glory. You were backing up just now. <laughs> eh? The song, that was the last song we sang. Uh -huh. I see Zion's king. My eyes have seen the exalted king. Uh -huh. His glory. Forever. You know, many of us don't listen to wordings of songs. Once they just do, boom, you say, I mean, the spirit, oh God, you are in, you are in Kano, you are in Kano. You don't change, you know that the, the thing we call in the spirit is not a different location per se. It's not different from here on the basis of location. Is different from here on the basis of dimension. So, transiting from this dimension to the next, one of the key things that makes that transition possible is knowledge. So, when you sing songs, goose pimples are not the presence. You can switch into that dimension and you will, you will not even have goose pimples, but you will know that you have entered a, a different frame of reference. We don't listen to wordings of song. As I was hearing the wordings of that song, my spirit was on fire. And that fire I'm feeling, you, you, you may not know now, but my entire body is on fire. That fire I'm feeling will soon touch down here. You don't need to say amen. It will touch down here. There are some of you, God will light you up tonight. Your hearts will burn. Your walking out of this building will be a plus to the kingdom of God such that darkness will flee at your presence. Will flee at your presence. I don't know how I got there about that song now, but what was I saying before I got there? Worship is a privilege. God is not lacking anything. 
And I'm about to say something that might hit your theology a little. God does not need man. In the sense of which you describe need, God does not need anything. God gives man the privilege of partnership with him. It's not as if God cannot do what he wants to do without man. Are you with me? God by himself creates a limitation for himself. He did it himself. Now, if he's going to invade our realm, man has become the privileged recipient of the rich benevolence of his grace. That you can now partner with an immortal spirit to actualize what is actually in the heart of the immortal spirit. So you would think you are doing it, but you are actually a puppet. God is the one pulling your strings behind the scenes. That's what Paul means when he says, it is God that worketh in you, both to will and to do. What verse is that? Give me that verse in NLT, because somebody is, 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 put NLT, 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 New Living Translation. For God is what? Working in you. What is he doing? He's giving you the desire and the what? Power. To do what pleases him. So it looks like you are the one doing it, but who is giving you the desire? Who is giving you the power? Lord. The Lord. So God is not, is not in need of anything. He lacks nothing. He needs nothing. If that were to ever become part of his nomenclature, then he cannot be God. So man was not created so that he can worship. Man was not created so that he can praise. Man was not created so that he can do something for God. While all these things are legitimate and they are powerful, the major reason man was created is so that God can multiply himself on the face of the earth. Man, primary design, man's primary design is to be a vessel that carries God. Are you with me tonight? This is why, dear brother, you are created spirit, soul, and body. So that in your spirit you can host God. And then as you walk upon the face of the earth, you can dispense his realities to a generation and to a world that is dying. This is man's primary design. But the man that walked out of Eden, walked out of Eden without the capacity to do business with God. Because he died. That death that he died was a separation from his father. Everything else connected to man also suffered that affliction. So when you get born again and you come into divine union with Christ, Everything, every environment, everything now begins to work against that. And one of the ways that you will prove that you know Jesus is in your willingness to obey him. To obey him. So Jesus was saying to Peter, after Peter said, uh, uh, if this is the way of a man with his wife, then it is better not to be married. Then Jesus responded and said, it's a good saying, but not everybody has the grace to survive it. So Jesus says, some are born as eunuchs from their mother's womb. So that means, dear brother, there are some people who from their mother's womb, marriage is not factored into their destiny. Are you here? He said, some are made eunuchs of men. That is, there are some who men castrate and they will not never ever be able to enter into the union that is called marriage. He said, some are eunuchs, made eunuchs by themselves. So there are some people who in the studio in eternity, God already knows that when they come to this earth, they will make a decision that marriage is not for them. Basically because they want to give themselves to the Lord. Did you not read what Paul said? He said that a virgin, he was speaking about single sisters. He said their primary focus is what? On how to do what? Please the Lord. But she that is married, 
her whole, uh, everything that drives her is how to please her husband. So Paul was literally saying that it is better to be single than to be married. Are you with me? I know that you want to marry. <laughs> I was preaching somewhere in my city and I said the things I'm saying now and I said, it's possible that you are here. And God is even telling you that you will never marry. His sister said, God forbid. <laughs> God forbid. In fact, I was in a youth conference in one major denomination. And then they were asking questions. They were trying to do teasers. They were trying to stir themselves up in the way of the Lord. And somebody said, what if on your wedding night, wedding day, as wedding is finishing, God just comes and says he wants to come now. Many of the young people say they will tell him to wait. They will tell him to wait. They say desperation to marry. And this is why Satan is exploiting us. Notice when you go around our churches, everything, the programs are designed to feed our appetites. I don't know whether that happens in Kano. But in my city, somebody can be doing a five-day meeting and the theme of the meeting is grace to receive visa. In my city, you see teams like my blood is bitter. Point and kill. 500 bachelors for 500 spinsters. And the place will be packed full. The question may I normally ask. So there are no longer people who were made eunuchs from the womb. So there are no longer people who the Lord, their love for God has driven them to the place where they say, marriage is not in my nomenclature. How come all of us want to marry? It's one of two things. It's either God lied or we are living a lie. There are many that have been spoken to. They don't want to obey. Because they think that when God gives you an instruction, he's trying to withhold something from you. I learned that the commandments of God are for preservation. God is not trying to deprive you of anything. He's trying to preserve you so that you can become what he has in mind. So she that is married should not look down on the one that is unmarried. And the one that is unmarried should not look down on the one that is married. Why? Every man is fulfilling his destiny. Before we travel very far in this conference, I need to ask you, have you found your destiny? This life you are living now, is it a product of absolute obedience until the relationship you entered, did God send you? That course you are doing now, that course, is it hunger that is driving it? Is it fame? Is it a desire to be comfortable in this realm or it is the kingdom you are living for? I want to do mercy. I want to do mercy. I want to be account. I want to do law. What was written in your blueprint in eternity? Have you peeped into those books? Is your life, if we study your life, is your life a chart? Is your life a pattern of one that has been living in absolute obedience? Can you say that where I am now in life, God led me here? The Lord came to Abraham and he said, leave your father's house, leave your kindred to a land I will show you. So every time Abraham stopped, you could, you could detail his journey and know that he was following his king. Who are you following? You see, the reason we must begin here is you cannot become a witness for one whom you are not absolutely surrendered to. You cannot. You cannot bear his message if you have not come to the place where you are living for him absolutely, you cannot carry his touch. You cannot carry his fire. You cannot carry his wisdom, his grace. 
and the fragrance of his presence if you have not become one that is addicted to obedience. Can God waste your life? Will you not cry out and say, me and Angela graduated together. God, why are you doing me like this? Who should he do? If he cannot do you, who is his child? Who should he do? 